So welcome, those of you who are viewing. Welcome to the STEM Career Expo panel for April 2020, hosted by Fermilab. My name is Susan Dahl, and we're going to tell you a little bit about what you'll be hearing from uh, today from the various STEM professionals that we have to talk with you. We would like to welcome you. This would be our 13th STEM Career Expo. And Fermilab uh, is a, America's uh, particle physics and accelerator laboratory. We're west of Chicago. And uh, according to our mission statement, we bring the world together to solve the mysteries of matter, energy, space, and time. We're a great lab that's world known internationally. And people often think of us as being STEM in a very uh, important setting of the Chicagoland area. But we really do partner with educators from several area high schools to offer the STEM Career Expo for high school students annually. Uh, the last STEM Expo that we had, and over the past 12 years, we've had as many as 180 STEM professionals from many STEM organizations, large and small, we did not want to lose the opportunity to share these inspiring stories and the important work of the STEM partners um, that we have to share with you today. And we really do want to know that you, we want you to keep striving and aiming to work in a STEM career, uh, to use STEM knowledge and skills to solve current and future problems. So I would like to thank our education partners Batavia High School, Geneva High School, Glenbard West High School, and Sue Sanders will be one of our moderators, York High School and Yorkville High School. Nikki Maestrick will be one of our moderators as well. In addition to the STEM Career Expo, the Fermi Lab Education Public Outreach Office offers many programs and resources for the education community, for students and the general public, please visit our website. So we do have five panels planned that will be in the form of these online videos and um, they will be available along with a question and answer forum. The videos will be available for the coming year. They'll all be available through this website here. We do thank the panelists a great deal. It's been wonderful to partner with them as well. And we've asked them to tell you how they arrived at their current career, about their educational path, a little bit about their high school years perhaps, and what they do in their day-to-day -day job. Because we have five different panels, I wanna introduce everyone to the possibility of seeing all of the various panels that you can view. Uh, we will be watching the panel, Science Panel 1 today. Uh, it includes an environmental scientist, flavor chemist, a lab analyst, a meat scientist, and a neutrino physicist. We also have San, uh, Science Panel 2 planned, which will include an accelerator physicist, an arborist, a geodetic scientist, a geologist, and a plant scientist. Our tech and math panel includes an actuary, a computer engineer, computer scientist, a data dissemination specialist, and an experienced designer. We also have two engineering panels planned. The first one includes an acoustics engineer, a chemical engineer, an engineering physicist, a fuels engineer, and a mechanical engineer. And the fifth panel, engineering panel two, includes an aerospace engineer, a chemical engineer, a civil engineer, a cryogenics engineer, and an innovation specialist. As I said, you will be viewing today uh, science panel one, and we will be hearing from Stephen, Terry, Sonia, Erica, and Kirsty. They'll do an introduction of e each of themselves, and then we will have a few questions. So thank you, 
and we'll introduce Stephen. You're welcome to introduce yourself by name, your career, and then your organization. Terry. Okay. Okay. Sorry, uh, Stephen. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> uh, thanks, Susan. Um, I'm just checking that you can hear me all right. Yes. Uh, so my name is Stephen McCracken, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be on the panel, and I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's presentation. It's very exciting for me to hear about all the great uh, science that everyone's doing. So I am, I'm an environmental scientist, and I work for an organization called the Conservation Foundation, which is a local uh, environmental nonprofit. But I actually spend all of my time working as a water resource uh, scientist, um, looking at uh, water quality in the areas of DuPage and Cook County. And I work for an organization um, that I do on behalf of an organization called the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group, which is a coalition of area wastewater treatment plants and stormwater entities. And essentially, my job description is to try to improve area uh, in, that is aquatic uh, river and lake biodiversity uh, while saving area taxpayers money. So we're trying to meet the goals of the uh, a law called the Clean Water Act and try to do that in a cost-effective way. Um, so what do I do all day? Well, I spend a lot of time working with data. So I spend a lot of time designing data collection. Uh, that, and this is, when I say data, I'm talking about uh, stream data. So we look at the chemistry of water. Uh, we look at the aquatic life in water, that's fish and insect life. We look at landforms in terms of topography, uh, what kind of uh, sediment is, uh, is present, what kind of vegetation is present, is present. And then we analyze a lot of that data. So we put it into geospatial format. Um, we were able to create maps out of it and run statistical analysis uh, out of it. And what we're trying to do there is come up with ways to increase the local biodiversity. Um, and we're trying to find patterns in that data that allow us to do that um, effectively. Um, so uh, to do all of this, we use a lot of, uh, as already mentioned, geospatial data. So we, we do a lot of thing called geographic information systems, which is a, a digital um, uh, a kind of a spatial database. Uh, use a lot of chemistry, uh, a lot of statistical analysis, um, and a lot of uh, graphical analysis. Uh, in fact, my son, I was helping him with some linear equations the other day, and he said, when am I ever going to use this stuff? And I was like, well, you <laughs> be surprised. I used some this morning. Um, so well, a lot of this kind of work is quite common to all environmental scientists, but the, the uh, thing that I'm excited about in my particular job is that I then get to take that information and turn it into a managerial outcome. Uh, in fact, as my background today is one of the projects that we implemented a few years ago, which is where we, instead of upgrading it to wastewater treatment plants, we uh, took uh, nearly two miles of river. This is up in Addison, and we rebuilt that river system to increase the biological capacity and on the measures that we use, we doubled the biodiversity within that section of river, uh, which is what the state and federal government were, were pushing us to do. Uh, and to make that happen, we, we ripped out a dam at the site, we surveyed the whole site, and we came up with a design template that we had statistically linked to aerial biodiversity. And so we had very high confidence that spending millions of dollars to upgrade the river like this was going to work. And we know that it worked because, uh, like all of our projects, we go back out and measure uh, what the impact was. So how did I get into this line of work? Um, well, uh, I grew up on a farm and I was always, uh, I was always very fond of science. So I, I read a lot of uh, physics and chemistry uh, books, um, but I also really liked the outdoors. And this seemed like a really good opportunity to put the two together. Now, when I was in high school, there was not any opportunities like this uh, to, to get in touch with real scientists who were doing the day-to-day -day work of, uh, of uh, you know, obtaining answers um, to, to life's big questions. Um, so I was actually David Attenborough, who is a, a famous, um, uh, well, he's a biologist, but he, he's very famous for not looking at the, the sort of the natural environment. It was his shows on TV that actually put me uh, into the mind that this was the kind of work that I wanted to go into. And uh, as I was saying, these two things allowed me to put science and the outdoors um, together. Uh, it has, I really enjoy what I do for uh, a living um, it, it's very exciting and uh, um, I, I really look forward to going to work uh, every day. It's also given me a lot of opportunity to travel. Um, I have lived in uh, all over Africa, parts of Europe and last year I got to go to India for the first time to speak. I was invited to speak at a water quality conference um, there. Uh, 
So in, in terms of education, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in geoscience, which is a uh, looking at uh, hydrology, uh, geology, geomorphology, uh, other physical sciences uh, like that, and also geospatial analysis. I also have a master's degree in, in, in resource management, specializing in water resources. And I also have a, a master's degree, a second master's degree, which I did while working, which is in economics. And the reason I studied economics is a little bit of deviation from the science side was that some of the questions that I was working on were, were much about resource allocation as they were about chemistry and uh, biology. So uh, I felt I needed to broaden out the tools I had for dealing with that kind of question. And with that, I'll, I'll keep quiet and let the other uh, panelists introduce themselves. Here, you'll be Do we just okay? Let me want no one to start. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Terry Measley. I'm a senior flavorist at Fona International. I've uh, been in the flavor industry as a flavorist uh, and a flavorist in training since '91. So coming up on 30 years in this industry. Um, Flavor sciences and, and being a flavorist is a subset of food science. And that's where my education came from. My bachelor's and master's degrees in food science uh, from the Ohio State University. Um, that was a while ago. Uh, and it's still a fascinating, ever-changing industry that encompasses everything from how the food is grown to how it's processed to how it's digested and what we do with everything uh, in between. Um, what I do is I help our customers solve problems generally. They're working with bases that uh, might be not the best tasting products. Say a lot of these high protein beverages and foods and such really don't taste very good. So we have to work with them to make them first palatable and then second taste very good. I work on a little bit more fun side of things on the savory end. The industry is split between sweet and savory. Sweet is where you're working on things like ice cream and beverages. Um, into the confection area and even into the uh, pharmaceutical area. On the savory side, it's more like uh, frozen meals, sauces, uh, meat flavors, snacks, that sort of thing. So that's what I do. It is essentially um, learning what makes food uh, taste and smell the way it does. And you're building a whole new language of chemistry in the brain. Um, the language of that is the, the chemistry behind it. So the vocabulary is the chemical families of those products and knowing what the different families and the different um, pieces within that family uh, taste and smell like. Um, so the foundation of that, you know, is the spices, it's cooking, it's um, all the natural extracts, and then moving forward from there. So we can modify products. We can take a vanilla extract or take a, you know, a broth that I've reacted, I've actually sort of cooked myself and then work to modify it further beyond that. Um, I grew up in the kitchen, I grew up cooking, so food science was pretty natural, but um, I was originally sort of interested in the engineering side of things until I realized my math just would not hold up to that, um, which generally means that your interest doesn't hold up to that. If, if you find a subject where you're really struggling with, it usually means you're not interested enough to really dive into it. Um, my dad would bring home trade magazines from all sorts of different trades. He's a chemist, a very brilliant chemist that worked in the pigments and dyes industries. And one of those was the food science uh, publications from the IFT and these other places. And that's what really caught my attention. So um, what do I do? Um, at this stage in my career, I'm doing a lot of training. I'm helping the younger chemists in our, in, in our uh, organization and our industry in general. Uh, get a better footing and uh, learn how to do it. And um, I'm expected to do more and more uh, independent stuff with our customers and actually get out there and do some sales support and that sort of thing as well. So that's always a lot of fun. Um, what else on food science sort of thing? It's, it's a super broad area. So I always try to evangelize for food science a little bit. So it encompasses microbiology, uh, various chemistries for anything that makes up the food, so the proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, everything like that. 
into the business side of things. So you're expected to learn some engineering and some business as well. Um, it's a great field. Uh, on the side, I do a lot of stuff on environmentally. So similar to um, you know, rehabilitating rivers, um, I'm out there looking for bees and wasps and uh, trying to find the areas that um, are good habitats for them and spreading the news for that. Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. Sonia will be next. Wow, so, so I'm really excited about following Stephen and Terry because Terry taught address chemistry. Stephen is a environmental uh, scientist and I'm a lab analyst, which is a very kind of general, uh, general you're in the lab doing uh, testing uh, parameters for whatever field that you want to be in. However, I work for a wastewater treatment plant, Fox Metro Water Reclamation District. Instead of discharging to, uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the DuPage River system and the Saltwater Creek wa uh, watershed, I uh, we discharge to the Fox River and the Fox River watershed, and uh, so that was really neat because some of my work has already been talked to about uh, uh, from Stephen, and the really interesting thing is if you do become a lab analyst, that is one of the careers you can grow into and transfer into as you, you learn. So when I was in um, high school, I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something with science, and I knew I wanted to, or if it wasn't gonna be science, in engineering, I really wasn't sure until I got into chemistry. And when I was taking my chemistry class, I really fell in love with spectroscopy. And it was really interesting to me, especially vis uh, visible spectroscopy, which is basically what you can see with your eyes, and that you could take and understand chemical reactions by color and the changes and what's happening in the, in the spectrum. Uh, the other really cool thing that really, one experiment that stuck out in my, in my mind is we took a substance, put it on a loop, and put that loop in a flame, and the flame changed color. And you could identify what metal was in that solution. And that just kind of blew my mind. And I'm like, all right, I know I'm gonna be a chemist. I don't know what I'm gonna do in chemistry, but I'm gonna be a chemist. So that's the thing that inspired me to study chemistry in college. So I've already talked about Fox Metro being the wastewater treatment plant. And what that means is when you, anything that you flush out of your house, anything that is flushed or drained out of a business into the sewage system, comes to our plant. And under the Clean Water Act, which we've heard about before, uh, we need to make sure that what leaves our plant isn't going to damage the river and isn't also under other, other, um, other uh, laws that we're not, uh, the solids that leave our plant also aren't going to, to damage where they are, they're applied and where they're so, uh, so what uh, we do in the lab is we're basically monitoring that process, making sure that the plant is operating appropriately, that we aren't poisoning the, uh, the environment, and then the industries that are discharging to us aren't po uh, poisoning our plant because we are treating our water with, uh, with uh, using bacterial processes. So if something kills those, bacteria, we won't be able to treat for the nutrients that are leaving the plant. So the things that we, uh, uh, samples that we get are industrial samples. We get uh, samples throughout the plant, and plant, so that means we get the raw stuff coming in, the, uh, the solid material that sometimes does not smell very pleasant. By the end of the process, it smells like dirt, and the water slowly gets cleaner as it goes through. We also sample the Fox River and generate data and understand that health of the Fox River so that, that we know that we're not damaging the environment. 
And then we usually send our data to environmental scientists and engineers such as Stephen, so they can, they can model and understand what's going on at those larger ecosystems. So the US EPA and Illinois EPA regulates us. What that means is our lab is not an investigative lab. We don't go take that sample and say, oh, what's in it? Let's go find it. Let's find that new chemical or that new, new technique. So we are very, uh, these two organizations in the state of Illinois, different, uh, different um, states have different, different agencies, but uh, we all report to the US EPA. We have to do those tests that they say we were required and we need to make sure they actually um, are meeting the levels that they'd say, oh, you can't be higher than that. An example of that is looking at chlorine. Uh, in our plant to make sure that that we're not releasing any uh, disease causing bacteria during uh, during the chlorination season which is March to I'm sorry not March May to October we chlorinate our effluent that's the material leaving the plant and the EPA sets a level for us of 0.04 for the size plant we have 0.04 0.04 ppm of chlorine is the maximum we could ever discharge without being in violation and damaging uh, the fish and the aquatic life that live in, in the downstream of us. So we need to make tests during that season every day we do chlorine and make sure that we're, we're not uh, exceeding that limit. The other types of uh, techniques we use is we during that same season, we look for fecal coliforms. We look, we use microscopy to understand the what's going on in our our aeration tanks. So we look at the health of the bacteria and the uh, the microinvertebrates that live on uh, live in on those bacteria or with those bacteria, and we use spectroscopic techniques to uh, to understand. Uh, how, ma how much nutrients might be coming into the, the um, plant and if we're, uh, uh, we're discharged, uh, if we are discharging the correct amounts and that we're not, uh, that our metals are also not, not uh, too high. So this is a very interesting career that you can take and develop into many different things. I've talked about possibly going on and developing yourself uh, like Steving, but you can also go on and get into regulatory management. Uh, we had one of the a lab analysts I know eventually became a, ma a mayor of a town. So you have a breadth of places that you can take the career and grow in ways that meet your, your interest. Thank you. Now we'll have Erica. Okay, here I am. I don't see me. <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me make sure I can see myself. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm really pleased to have a chance to talk to everybody. And I'm sorry we're not there in person this year. I really miss coming to STEM and seeing everybody. Um, my name is Erica Vogue, kind of like Vogue Magazine is the way we pronounce it. And I am a meat scientist. And people always say to me like, what in the heck is a meat scientist? So the thing to do, I think, is to kind of talk to you from about my life from the beginning. I started my career uh, I was in high school here in, in Glen Ellen. I went to Glenbard West and I was a 4-H'er. I really liked riding my horse. And I don't know, if there's a picture of me riding my horse at the DuPage County Fair, okay? And I really liked riding my horse and, and I was really good at math and I liked science. And when I went to college at University of Illinois, um, I had no idea what I was gonna do with my career. I was either going to be a, a child psychologist, a veterinarian, or an artist. Okay, well, as you can see, I ended up being a meat scientist and that has nothing to do with those three. So what happened was they put me into a course called uh, Animal Science 100 and I got to learn about agriculture animals. And it was a wonderful course because it was all hands on. So I got to, I got to work with animals in the livestock pavilion, learn about sheep and cattle and horses and pigs. And we got to learn about companion animals. And that 
geared me in the direction of animal science. So I got a bachelor's degree in animal science. And at the time they told me, hey, you're not from a farm. And almost everybody that was in agriculture at that time studying in an agriculture career came from a farm. And they said, maybe you wanna do something beyond your undergraduate work and you should think about going into a graduate program. Well, I had been on something called the meat judging team and there we judge meat, okay? And we look at entire sides of beef and, and whole hams and everything. And I had done really well at meat judging. And so they said, maybe you want to go into graduate school and be a meat scientist. And I thought, okay, that sounds really good. And, and the things that I learned a lot about were chemistry of meat, about the muscle biology. Um, I love the microbiology. I just thought microbiology was fantastic. And I learned how meat could be spoiled, you know, how we could ferment meat and turn it into summer sausage and things like that. Um, so, so it was a wonderful career. Uh, I got to learn about all kinds of different things. And what happened was after I graduated, I went to work for Oscar Mayer. And so my first career was with Oscar Mayer, which was a wonderful place to work. Um, that's part of Kraft. And they, they taught me everything you needed to know. I was in what was called quality assurance. And so they taught us how to make the perfect hot dog, the exact amount of fat in that product, the exact shape of each hot dog had to be perfect. I got to make Lunchables. I was there when Lunchables were first created and at, from the very beginning and, and got to start up that line in my plant in Davenport, Iowa. So I, I got to learn a lot about quality and food safety, how we could make the hot dogs last as long as possible so that you could still eat them 70 days after they had been made. We were making 3,700 pounds at every hour of hot dogs and we were making giant batches. And my husband always jokes, you know, she, she can only cook if it's a 16,000 pound batch, okay? So then um, after about 11 years, I was living in Iowa and I met a wonderful man here and moved to Chicago and was working for a company called OSI, making the burgers for McDonald's and chicken nuggets and filet of fish all over the world. When I started in quality assurance there, they were making, we had 22 plants worldwide. And when we finished, we had about 76. So I got to work globally. I have visited and worked in over 26 countries and visited 40. And then by 2003, I was ready to start consulting. So I started my consulting career at this point. And at, um, one of the things that I do, that I evolved into was humane handling of the livestock. And that means, you know, humane handling, seeing them on their last day. And I get to work with a very fascinating lady named Dr. Temple Grandin. She, she's autistic. Many of you may have heard of her from the autistic world, but she's also very famous in the livestock world. So I've gotten to travel with her all over the world and she's my teacher and she teaches me about humane handling. At this point, I spend a lot of time teaching people about humane handling and consulting with plants about humane handling. And then I also still work with smaller plants around the world and here in the States to help them with food safety, sanitation, um, government regulations, and making sure that, um, that they're meeting the regulations. My last trip was to Nicaragua in, in February. And the neat thing about that was I had been there in 2004 teaching them how to export to US and I got to go back and work with, with the same four beef plants and see how they had evolved and grown up and really expanded. And now they're, they're doing a wonderful job exporting to US. So that's my life as a meat scientist. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Hi, my name is Kirsty. Um, I'm a neutrino physicist at Fermilab, so I study a fundamental particle called the neutrino. Um, fundamental particle means it's one of the particles we think makes up the universe and it can't be divided into anything smaller. Um, neutrinos are incredibly tiny and uh, they are absolutely everywhere, but you may have never even heard of them before. Um, a good example I like to give is if you hold out your thumbnail, uh, every second, about a hundred million neutrinos go through your thumbnail. Uh, most of them are coming down from the sun. 
but they almost never do anything uh, in your entire life. Uh, you've got you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of nutrients passing through you all the time. In your entire life, maybe one of them will actually hit an atom in your body. Um, all of the rest of them just go through because they're so tiny, they don't even notice you're there. Um, but this is about my career. Uh, so I think a lot of people think if you're kind of in academic science, it's something that you always wanted to do and it's been your life's goal. Um, that's not necessarily true for me. I, when I was younger, I had a very hard time seeing myself as a scientist. Um, partly, I think, because uh, the pictures you see of like a scientist is some old guy with like crazy hair and a lab coat or like some really nerdy guys who are really into computer games and stuff. And I, I never saw myself doing that. Um, I also, when I was young, I was quite clever. I was quite good at maths and science. And people told me, uh, you're clever, so you should be a doctor or a lawyer. So I was like, okay, I am way too squeamish to be a doctor. Anything involving the inside of my body, I don't need to know the ways that can go wrong. Um, so I decided I was going to be a lawyer. In the UK, law is an undergrad degree. So I decided I was going to go do law. And then I spoke to a lawyer at Careers Fair who said to me, even though you can do it as an undergrad degree, you shouldn't. You should do something else as an undergrad and do law as postgrad. Uh, so I went home from that and I don't even remember even thinking about it. I just went home and said, OK, I'm going to study physics then. Um, so I did physics um, as an undergrad degree. I still thought that I would leave and do law. And about halfway through, I realized that um, I hate writing stuff. So law was not gonna go well for me, uh, but that's okay because if you've got a degree in physics, you can do a lot of kind of technological business, economics. There's a lot of careers you can go into if you have a good grounding in kind of maths and science and data analysis. Uh, so cool, I'll go work in the city and make loads of money doing some kind of trading or something. Uh, and then I don't really know what happened, uh, but I did a master's, uh, but I still was gonna go and make all my money in the city. And then after my master's, I applied to one job uh, in the tech division of Unilever and two PhD places. And then the thing I really wanted to do was like a study abroad year for a second master's in Germany, just because I wanted to live in Germany. I thought that sounded cool. Um, and then I got offered one of the PhD places, which wasn't really what I'd planned. I kind of thought I'll do this as a test. Um, and then next time when I'm really applying for things, I'll know how to do an interview. But they offered me a place and I asked if I could defer it for a year so I could go live in Germany and they said no. Uh, so I did a PhD in particle physics. Um, I still, still kind of thought I would leave and do something else. Um, and then at the end of that, I've been kind of doing physics now for about nine or 10 years um, and accepted that this is what I do. Uh, so I came to Fermilab and I've now been working at Fermilab about three years. Um, and I've also stopped thinking more than about three years in the future. So I spend less time stressing about whether I am a physicist and more about whether this is what I want to do now. Um, in terms of what I do, uh, it's, we work in really, in particle physics, it's really big collaborations. Um, I work with a group of about 300 people on one experiment. Uh, so it's not the kind of tabletop science where you actually have a thing that you're building yourself. Uh, we have a big detector that we built as a group. And now a lot of the work is actually just analyzing the data. So it's kind of statistical analysis, a lot more computer programming than I was prepared for. Um, but there's also, if you're interested, people do work on building new detectors. Uh, that's not my forte, but people do. Um, and then we also have the kind of operations of the detector that we're running at the moment. Uh, so for example, I'm responsible for what's called data acquisitions, which is all the computer systems that get the data out of the detector so that we can study it. Um, and so a lot of the time I'm on call 24 seven, if something goes wrong with that, someone can call me and I'll help fix it. Um, or other times I'll be doing, we have shifts at all times monitoring the detector. So other times I'll be taking say an eight hour shift of constantly watching it. 
uh, but I think that's probably my five minutes. So I'll stop talking and we can get to questions. Awesome. I never expected that I'd smile so much listening to science and stuff that I didn't quite understand. Thank you guys so incredibly much for those stories. Those are awesome. And I think for, for myself, who is definitely not in high school, but for our high school students, I think this definitely helps them kind of bring it to life of, of you guys' journey. With that being said, a lot of you guys did speak to the history behind why you made your choices. I think it'd be interesting if you could tell us a little bit about what surprised you when you got into your field. So if you raise your hand, uh, if you like to speak. Anyone? Um, I'll, awesome. I'll go into go that, ahead, sure. Uh, one thing that surprised me uh, getting into the, uh, I was in food science, so basic wet chemistry we knew a lot about. What we didn't know a lot about and still don't know a huge amount about is physiology, how our senses work, how our, especially the senses of smell. Um, we just don't know that much about it. We know what things do when, when they get in there and what they, they turn into and the language of, you know, why a, a tangerine smells different from a, an orange. We can know about those compounds. We don't know about the senses, and that's a fascinating area to keep track of. Uh, there's a group called uh, the Monell Sensory Institute in Philadelphia that does a lot of that. Um, and same with the, uh, the taste buds and how our taste system works and how we have sensors all throughout our you know, our GI tract, keeping track of these sort of things. Um, just that it's kind of a black box. You know, your eyes and your, your nose and your mouth are extensions of your brain with neurons coming straight out of the brain, right, right there exposed to the world. Um, it's just fascinating. Anyone else like to add? Yep, go ahead, Sonia. There you go. So one, th uh, one thing that it really surprised me was uh, traditionally uh, when you go, when we go into environmental science and before people really got in, in concerned with climate change, there, there was kind of a idea that, oh, this is a dead field. There's nothing new to be, uh, be learned. And so it was, very surprising to me when I first started that there were uh, that there were active investigations on finding new ways and better ways to do things. For example, there we were looking at uh, if not Fox Metro, but researchers that are are at at Chicago Metropolitan Wastewater uh, Water District that were looking at using PCR in a quantitative ma manner to identify uh, uh, pathogens in wastewater. And so it's interesting now, given our uh, current situation with COVID-19, that research that was going on when I first entered the field uh, in environmental uh, chemistry in a wastewater treatment plant is come around and that interest has, has uh, evolved and come into new, in new ways. Awesome. Eric, I saw that you wanted to add something. Then Stephen, I saw you, uh, you follow up right behind her. Okay, if, if, if I'm going first. The, yes, please, the, Eric. The thing, the thing that I learned how to teach and I learned how, I learned how to analyze and everything like that, but the part that I missed in school that I had to learn on the job was really managing people, okay, and working with people, and and literally, that's something that with with a scientist, you're not you're not necessarily born to be a leader and to and to work with people. And and you know, one of my most famous stories was that when I worked in Davenport, Iowa, at Oscar Meyer, my secretary said, "You need to say good morning," and I said, "Well, I said good morning <laughs> yesterday. You're the same person. You know, why do I have to say good morning again? You know, you're still the same person." And she's like, "No, you just don't understand." Yeah it's very polite to say good morning and it's very impolite to not say good morning. And so um, I had some wonderful training classes on, on how to manage people. And I think that organizational behavior and understanding how to manage people and work with people, it's been a skill that I learned on the job and it's helped me tremendously 
but it's not something that I came out of school knowing, okay? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Steven, tell, tell us your side. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm uh, retracing some of the steps covered by uh, Terry and uh, Sonia, but um, I think it's also a surprise to me that, you know, you kind of go into your first job thinking that, you know, everything's known um, and you're, you know, you're just going to do this thing and you're going to do it over and over again. Um, and in fact, what you find is that, you know, the, the universe is very mysterious and we, we really don't know that much about it. And that even on the most mundane tasks, uh, you know, you were finding out new things and having to approach problems in new ways and think them through. So it's, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think for, if I was to talk to my younger self at that age, that'd be one of the things to say is that, you know, that you really, you know, there's a lot of things still to know about this. And even in, even in aspects of the career where things are quite well understood, there's still a lot of uh, detail and application at your specific level that needs to be needs to be worked through and and um, and managed. So so that that keeps it very interesting. And then I, I think my other other thing was that that um, outside of science, you know, there's a lot of other aspects to the career um, uh, that, that need to be kept in mind. And that could be you know uh, the practical bent about managing instrumentation and um, you know understanding uh, how to make you know. Uh, uh, machines work, or uh, as as uh, Eva was saying, uh, personnel management. You know those things aren't necessarily taught. Uh, right. level. I had some other work that I had done that helped me with a lot of that, but that was also uh, also something that's critical. So I I think that you, you know that being focused completely on science and technology is great, but you shouldn't neglect those other aspects to round out your your character because they are going to be called upon in your career. Awesome. I saw Kirsty's hand up as well. Yep, Kirsty, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was gonna say, it's a little bit different, I guess, because my, my career seems like it should be more linked to what I did or what we did in school. Uh, but the main thing that surprised me is how much it's not like the physics we did in school. Um, <laughs> and even university, you know, I don't do very much physics most days. I do a lot of computing and a lot of statistics um, and a lot of kind of people management and that sort of thing. Uh, but a big surprise to me was uh, that it's, you know, the physics that you do at university is very similar to the kind of stuff you learn in science at school. Um, and that is very not similar to what I spend most of my time doing now. Mm. Any last bits? Sonia, did you have something to add? Okay. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Awesome, perfect. I was just going to ask, are there any particular classes that you, that you took in high school or that you wish you would have taken in high school and college that, uh, that you would have found successful to your career? So whether it's, a, whether it's a class that you actually took in high school or college or one that you wish you would have once you got into the field. Anyone uh, raise your hand, let me know. Oh, go ahead, Emily. I'm sorry, Erica. Yeah, okay. Um, just Mrs. Parr in Glebard West was my English teacher, okay? And, and I stopped her in, in the, I, I saw her at, at the supermarket after I graduated and I said, Mrs. Parr, you taught me so much in in my English class and my creative writing and everything. And I said, and it has helped me so much in my career because I write a lot of reports. At this point, I have I actually have a Latin American blog in a in a meeting magazine called Carnitech. And so I write articles that are blogging in Brazil and in Latin America. Okay. And and I stopped her and she she was in tears, but but my writing class in high school has carried me through my career. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Anyone else? Go ahead, Sonia. And then we'll take Kirsty. I would say, say I would take, um, besides the English class and being able to communicate, and uh, that I would also 
possibly take something where you have to give speeches mm -hmm. and you get comfortable doing debates. And but everyone debates. hates that communications class. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's important and it is very, very valuable. And I would also say stretch yourself. Um, take a try a, a, a business class, accounting, something where that is different than science and technology. Uh, so, because you're out there as a scientist and you need to talk to people across all walks of life and your field, you, you may be, for example, sometimes we, we go out to industries and look at what they're doing and we need to be able to understand what their goals as a business owner is. Perfect, go ahead, Kiersey. Uh, yeah, I didn't even think about the communications class, but that is a really good point. Um, I still think back, I never had that in high school, but in university we had one, and I still look back at that course sometimes and think about the stuff they taught us. Um, the thing that I wish I'd learned in high school was computer programming, um, because I use that every day. Um, I never was formally taught to do it, so I had to work it out for myself. Um, wow. I would have loved to be taught to do it. And I think even more going forward, the kind of skill set that you get with STEM is going to come really entwined with needing to be able to do computer programming. So being literate in that, I think really helps. Cool. Stephen or Terry, any of you have anything last minute things to add? Go ahead, Terry. Oh, unmute yourself, Terry. There you go. All right. Uh, no, I had a really good broad background. It's not really so much things I didn't take, but would like to, but I always recommend kids, if they're not really sports oriented and don't learn to do teams and such like that, even if they are, to do some theater. Uh, even if you don't have a speaking role, you know, getting up there on stage really takes everything away from the intimidation. Um, even if you got a couple lines, that's even better. Um, you'll, you'll are also in high school, you'll be building the sets and you'll do all that as well. So it's a great background for this. Oh, that's a really great one. Stephen, anything you'd like to add? Okay. Do we have time for one more or are we, are we going to wrap up? Awesome. Well, thanks so much to our panel. Like I said, I never expected to smile so much, to laugh so much. Your stories really, really help bring everything to life. And thank you so much for your time and bringing this to our students. So for all of you watching, we hope you have found this panel interesting and inspiring. You may follow up on the website to ask a question of a specific person or career or pose a question to the group of professionals. The question form is available on the same page as the video. Watch for the 2021 in-person STEM Career Expo at Fermilab in April 2021. And all the videos can be found here at this website. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.